It's being called a game changer for Africa's economies. A $3.4 trillion economic bloc that aims to connect over 1 billion people and create the world's largest free trade zone. This week, my exclusive interview with the man tasked with overseeing the African continental free trade area, Wamkele Mene. It's a very important ambition uh, in the step of Africa's integration. We cannot continue anymore in the balkanization that we are in. We cannot continue anymore not to be globally competitive. We'll also show you what a new report by the group Africa No Filter reveals about the link between the media and investment in Africa and why they say some narratives about the continent can be downright dangerous. Stories and perceptions and the perceptions they create are very powerful. Stories about business in Africa and how they are framed have a direct impact on the individual's motivation and desire to set up new businesses and to trade with, invest in, or finance businesses. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello there and welcome to the show. I'm Heidi Adams. Thank you so much for joining me. On January 1st, 2021, African countries opened their markets under the continent's historic free trade agreement. Now, this pact is designed to make it easier for African countries to do business with each other. And experts say if all goes well, it could lift 30 million people out of extreme poverty. Let's take a quick look at what else this free trade agreement entails and what it hopes to accomplish. The Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, or AFCFTA, aims to better integrate Africa's economies, forming a single market for goods and services, increase productivity, and boost trade between African countries. It promises to create jobs and improve competitiveness of African industries on the global stage. This One Africa market will also eliminate non-tariff barriers. Those are rules and procedures that add to the difficulty and cost of importing and exporting goods, such as delays at borders and highly technical product safety requirements. Analysts worry this treaty will put Africa's more advanced countries at an advantage, allowing nations with more developed manufacturing capacity to sell their products and services to less developed nations, undercutting industries in those smaller economies. While challenges and sticking points remain, it's hoped this free trade zone set to be the world's largest will eventually lead to the free movement of people across Africa and even a single continental currency. Well, I spoke to the man whose job it is to promote, coordinate and implement this landmark pact. Wamkele Mene is the Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Secretariat. He gave me an exclusive interview during his recent trip to Washington and told me why he is such a fierce advocate for Africa's economic integration. Wamkele Mene, the Secretary General of the Africa Continental Free Trade Secretariat, thank you so much for speaking to us. We thank appreciate you. your time. We are now just over one year in to the rollout mm -hmm. of the free trade zone. What do you make of what has been accomplished so far? Well, we established this uh, trade agreement in the middle of a pandemic. We started implementation in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, so it was immensely challenging to uh, uh, get countries to focus on trade in the middle of a public health crisis. However, we have used uh, the, the last two years uh, very, very effectively. We now have a very strong legal foundation to start trading under the AFCFTA. Uh, we have all of the protocols, all of the legal instruments that are required to start trading under the AFCFTA. We have established uh, now uh, a Pan-African Payments and Settlement System to ensure that as we trade under the AFCFTA, that we trade uh, in an efficient way, in a way that is cost effective, and in a way that will ensure inclusivity. Africa is 42 currencies. If you are in Ghana, you want to trade with somebody in Kenya, you have to first convert the uh, Ghanaian city into the dollar. 
and then you transact with your counterparty in Kenya, they have to convert the dollar to the shilling. This costs about $5 billion annually, uh, the cost of currency convertibility. Uh, and that is a constraint to intra-Africa trade. So we've introduced this uh, Pan-African Payments and Settlement System along with our partner, uh, Africsin Bank. We also have now uh, reached convergence on 88% of rules of origin, uh, which basically means that going forward, we will now be able to trade on the basis of the same rules for products, uh, local content rules uh, for products. Think about it this way. If you are Toyota and you've established in Ghana, you want to exp expand, uh, let's say, to North Africa, you are subject to different rules. Before the AFCFTA came into being, you were subject to different rules. Now that we have the AFCFTA, we have the rules of origin, the same rules will apply uh, throughout the African continent. So this is a significant uh, achievement uh, to get convergence on, uh, on local content requirements. We've also established a dispute settlement body, the first of its kind on the African continent. Right up until the AFCFTA was uh, established, if you had a dispute, um, if there were countries that were in dispute over trade, investment, uh, intellectual property, they would have to resolve that dispute either at the WTO, through WTO rules, if they are WTO members, or they would have to go to international arbitration under ICC rules. So we've now created our own mechanism for dispute settlement to make sure that we, we build the confidence of African investors and non-African investors, uh, and of course, to make sure that our continent is, is, uh, has a positive investment climate. The third area, uh, or rather fourth area of, um, of, of success is uh, the collaboration that we have built with Africsim Bank and African Development Bank uh, to make sure that all of the investments that are being made in infrastructure are investments that uh, support trade. For example, um, we, we facilitated a um, uh, trade infrastructure supporting finance uh, project in, uh, on the border between Zambia and the DRC uh, to make sure that goods that are flowing from Southern Africa into Central Africa through the DRC, that there is a dry port facility that will expedite. So in a short space of time, we, we, have, uh, we have done extremely well under, under very difficult circumstances uh, that were caused by, uh, by the pandemic. You are right now the face of this agreement. It is not just your job to coordinate it, but also to implement it. What would you say to, to ordinary people in their respective countries on the continent watching? What would you tell them they can look forward to in terms of the, the specific industries and sectors that will benefit most from, from this? And also, how will this free trade zone play out in their daily lives? Mm -hmm. Well, if you are a small medium enterprise owner, or if you are a young entrepreneur, your objective, presumably your objective as a business, is to, is to grow your business, expand your business, uh, reach new markets, and, and, uh, and ensure that you have a sustainable business model that is uh, going to flourish throughout the continent. Presumably that's the objective of any uh, business owner. And so what the AFCFTA offers is the opportunity to scale. We have a market of 1.3 billion people, combined GDP of uh, 3.4 trillion uh, dollars, which by the year 2030 is uh, projected to be close to 7 trillion United States dollars. And so it's a, it's a significant market. So the AFCFTA offers um, small medium enterprises, young entrepreneurs, the opportunity to scale, to reach new markets. If you are a, um, a, a business owner in Malawi, you now have an opportunity to uh, explore new markets in North Africa, in West Africa, outside of the SADC region. And similarly, if you are in, in ECOWAS, if you are in the Gambia, you now have an opportunity to uh, reach new markets in East Africa, in Kenya, and so on. Um, we have identified critical value chains that will be 
job creating value chains, the automotive sector, for example, pharmaceuticals. And so the big challenge is, as you were uh, alluding, how do we make sure that in the automotive sector, for example, we create jobs as, as we trade and as we roll out uh, this agreement throughout the continent. So Liberia is processing rubber. Zambia is processing copper and other components uh, around countries of the continent so that we have inclusivity uh, of benefits and we create jobs uh, uh, for uh, millions and millions of Africans. And we know that it is, it is actually possible uh, because as I mentioned in the example today, if you look at um, the fact that today Lesotho supplies gap, uh, textiles and clothing, 20 years ago, um, who would have imagined that that would be possible? But today Lesotho is globally competitive in the area of garments. And, and that has been enabled by a trade agreement creating thousands and thousands of jobs, decent jobs, uh, mainly uh, for women. So that's the value of, of, of this trade agreement and that's the potential that it presents uh, to all of us uh, as Africans. And we know our continent has basically made the rest of the world wealthy. And it, it, we're now pooling resources, Africa's own resources. This agreement, ultimately, will it lift all boats? Will it lift everyone out of poverty in Africa? It, it has the potential to do that, but it won't happen on its own. The World Bank estimated that uh, this agreement can lift 100 million Africans out of poverty by the year 2035. But that won't happen on its own. We will have to make sure that we aggressively implement it to create opportunities for the small medium enterprises that I mentioned, for young entrepreneurs, to create opportunities where people will actually, if you are able to expand uh, your market as a business or as, an as, or as an entrepreneur, you are creating jobs not only for yourself but, but for others. Uh, and so I believe that it has the potential to do precisely that. But we have to make sure that uh, we work hard to implement the agreement. It won't, it won't happen on its own. Uh, we, we have a very unique opportunity on our continent to um, use this agreement to really reduce our reliance on the export of primary commodities, which we have been exporting for decades and decades. Uh, primary commodities that have, that, that have kept us in this colonial pattern, this colonial economic model where we supply um, unprocessed raw materials to other parts of the world. And so the AFCFTA is really geared towards um, value-added production, encouraging value-added production, manufacturing, and export intra-Africa trade of value-added products so that we rely less on the export of uh, primary commodities. Of course, it's going to take time. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but if we want to break this and dismantle this colonial economic model where we rely uh, so much on the export of primary commodities, we have to really re fundamentally restructure the face of Africa's economy. And we can only do that through leveraging this market of 1.3 billion people, creating a market for ourselves and uh, ensuring that we boost our productive capacity. One of the criticisms of um, other free trade agreements in other parts of the world uh, has been that it urbanizes um, to a much greater extent um, places. Now, of course, we have rapid urbanization on the continent, but does this agreement pose the risk of urbanizing to the detriment of people in rural areas? What would be the benefits for, for people who are working in the, first of all, informal sector, and then also in the rural areas? We, we have, that's exactly why we have just started a, uh, a project on trade and sustainable development and trade and environment, uh, because we know that, that usually trade agreements benefit those who are already in urban areas. And so we are looking, for example, at how do we um, enable uh, uh, fishing communities in villages, in marine uh, or coastal areas, how do we bring them into the fold of implementation of the AFCFTA by creating a, a, a framework 
a framework for, for, for them to be able to export and to trade in marine life, for example, the sustainability that we want to see from a trade agreement. And so it's a very important uh, objective because if we, if we are perceived to be benefiting only those who are in the cities, uh, we will not have this agreement, uh, will not have uh, the credibility that, that it should have. And so trade, environment and sustainability is a very important in the, in the context of implementation of this agreement because we, we, if we fail to be inclusive, particularly in relation to people in remote areas, I'm afraid we, we will lose all credibility uh, when we talk about inclusive trade agreements. Uh, we use the word agreement, of course, a lot, but there are areas where there is not exactly yet mm -hmm. agreement. The idea of free movement of labor and people, are all countries sold on that idea? Because for once, Nigeria was very hesitant in the beginning to be part concerned about cheaper goods coming into the country, undermining sectors in their own economy. What do you say to those countries? And I also want to ask you about the country that you and I are from. This idea of a visa-free zone. Uh, South Africa, Nigeria, not on board with that idea. And we know that we have incidents of xenophobia in South Africa. How do you sell this idea of a visa-free zone to those countries? Uh, and is the plan, the long-term plan, to bring them on board? I, first, let me just say, I strongly support um, free movement of persons. Because I think free movement of persons, as we've seen in, um, in the example of the model of integration of the European Union, it has worked. So I strongly support free movement of persons across uh, the, the African continent. Of course, governments have to bear in mind other uh, uh, concerns, uh, security concerns, and so on. But as a principle, I think, I think that if you look at economic history, it's clear that uh, free movement of person, persons does contribute to increased volumes of, of, of trade and to increased economic uh, activity across a region, in this case the European Union. The AFCFTA does not include free movement of, of uh, persons. That's a separate protocol under the African Union. What the AFCFTA does include is movement of business persons. Um, and, and that's a very important first step that I believe we have to take because the reality is that across the continent there are these sensitivities about free movement of persons. As much as I think it is desirable that just like uh, um, uh, Rwanda, Rwanda has, um, uh, uh, you get a visa on arrival. Um, Nigeria, you get a visa on arrival uh, as an African. Ghana, you get a visa on arrival. So I think these are the, the first steps that we have to take uh, towards um, a, a fully meaningful free movement of persons. And the AFCFTA uh, provides as a first step free movement of business persons that uh, uh, will ensure that we support the, uh, um, the, 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 the enhancement uh, of trade through movement of persons um, ultimately uh, when we get to that point. But I, 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 I do think that it is a very, very important um, ambition if we want to integrate our continent. It's a very important ambition uh, in the step of Africa's integration. We cannot continue anymore in the balkanization that we are in we cannot continue anymore not to be globally competitive. And one of the ways in which we can be globally competitive is, as I said earlier, by consolidating our market. And so I, I hope that uh, in, in the, the, the near future, in years to come, that we will see free movement, of, free movement of persons and that all of the security concerns that countries have expressed, that they will be, they will be addressed. On the matter of goods uh, that are, are, are transiting across borders, it is true that there were countries that had genuine concerns about um, a dumping of products. The AFCFTA is not about a country taking a, uh, a product from a third country outside of Africa, taking a shirt, putting a button on it, saying made in the AFCFTA, 
and transshipping it uh, within the AFCFTA. That does not create jobs. That creates job losses. And we do not want uh, this agreement to create job losses. So that's why uh, we have very, very strong rules of origin. The threshold for a product to be uh, identified as made in the AFCFTA, the threshold is very high. You will not be able to take a shirt, put a button on it and say made um, in the AFCFTA. You will have to prove that there was sufficient and adequate value addition um, uh, and processing of that product on the African continent in order for it to benefit under the AFCFTA. Um, I just quickly want to stay on that point with you mm -hmm. quickly uh, because I was coming to this about safeguards for quality and safety standards, but not just for things like food or medicines, but also safety standards for workers. Mm -hmm. All countries do not have the same rules, laws, policies, and of course all countries are not developing on the same track. What have signatory countries agreed to in terms of those kinds of protocols? We, we, those protocols are not part of the AFCFTA. They are outside of the scope of the AFCFTA. Uh, so they continue to be the exclusive jurisdiction of, uh, uh, of member states. Uh, the, the, there is a limit to the scope of a trade agreement. Um, I know that in other parts of the world, trade agreements include labor standards, environmental standards, but we have not included those. Uh, I don't know whether or not in future they will be included. That is entirely the, uh, the decision of uh, what we call state parties, which is the member states. Uh, but for now, we, we don't include in the scope of the agreement, we don't include, include those protocols. Um, a final question. Um, you know, countries initially, of course, erected trade barriers to protect their markets from regional competition. Mm -hmm. The impact of the agreement on bilateral agreements that individual countries have with, say, the United States or the European Union, how does this agreement affect those relationships? Those um, pre-existing agreements will continue uh, to, to uh, exist. In fact, uh, the AFCFTA is very clear, uh, the text, the legal text is very clear that countries have to continue to live up to their obligations under third uh, country agreements. And so there is no intention to nullify obligations uh, that countries have vis-a-vis -vis third countries, that AFCFTA countries have vis-a-vis -vis third countries. Those obligations, those rights, that they have in respect of those countries will continue, um, unless, of course, they, they mutually terminate the agreement. So we, we are not going to get involved uh, with third country uh, agreements. The priority, and the, the heads of states were very clear uh, in their assembly decision, the priority is to make sure that the, um, uh, the AFCFTA is consolidated and is implemented. There is no prohibition um, under the AFCFTA from a country for a country to negotiate with a third country. You can, it is legally permissible um, under rules of the AFCFTA provided that if you are negotiating with a third country, provided that you grant to the AFCFTA country the same treatment, the same benefits or better that you are giving to the third country. And so there will be a coexistence um, between the AFCFTA and other international agreements in the context of trade uh, in Africa. That will always uh, be there. And was part of the desire not that the, the continent now be able to negotiate with the rest of the world as a bloc? Well, th that's, that's actually an, the objective. The objective is for Africa uh, to, we are following what we call a linear model of integration. We are now in the phase of the free trade agreement. The next phase will be a customs union, and the customs union will enable us to negotiate as, as a bloc uh, with third countries, uh, with China, the EU, the US, or whichever third country. Once we reach the level of being a customs union, we will then be able to uh, negotiate uh, as a bloc. The, the, the aspiration is that one day Africa will have the highest level of integration, a monetary union, uh, that will enable us uh, to use a single currency to trade. Uh, so we're following these steps of uh, integration 
And now we are at the very beginning of our uh, um, model of integration. Wam Kelemene, the Secretary General of the Africa Continental Free Trade Secretariat, thank you for your time. Thank you. We look forward to what's coming next for the continent and we wish you all the best as you travel throughout the continent to promote this pact. Thank you very much. And that was Wamkele Mene, the Secretary General of the Africa Continental Free Trade Secretariat, speaking to me here in Washington. So what are the pros and cons of free trade agreements? How inclusive are they? And what are the lessons African countries can glean from free trade agreements in other parts of the world? I have two guests with me to help break it down for us. With me here in studio is Val Okaro Bissant. She's the founder and general counsel at Afrocosmo Development Impact. And joining us via Skype is Frank Somalis. He's a partner and co-chair of the global of global trade at Squire Patton Boggs here in Washington, D.C. Bell and Frank are both experts in international trade law and policy. Hello to both of you and welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Val, I'm going to start with you. So the Secretary General, as you of course saw, Wamkele Mene, uh, he came to Washington to, of course, address an audience here, an event that, in fact, you yes. and Frank co-hosted. Uh, right. Val, who came to hear Wamkele Mene speak here in Washington, and what did people want to know from him? Yes, uh, good question. Uh, the people that came were basically um, esteemed, you know, stakeholders from public and private sector. We also had... Uh, um, media represented. You were there, Haiti, so that was wonderful. <laughs> we had uh, high-level, uh, you know, trade policy makers and implementers present, and we also had ambassadors, um, African ambassadors primarily present. We also had a U.S. ambassador, Wiesner, who was one of our, um, he made the introductory uh, remarks, so that was wonderful. Yes, so the, basically that was it. It was a really wonderful uh, event. Uh yeah. The, the Africa um, Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat says, uh, Frank, economic integration is a process. And, of course, experts are talking about a, a multi-decade process here. Uh, how long should we wait or how long should it be before we can expect to see real results from this? And, and here I mean for, for ordinary people, for people who will, should most benefit from this, those who run businesses, not just big corporations. Right. Well, that's a good question. It, it does take a while. What uh, Basically, the agreement creates a customs union. If you think of the European Union, it's similar to that for Africa. So ultimately, tariffs will be removed. And more importantly for the average person, uh, tariffs and restrictions on services will be eliminated. So those folks who are in the business of providing services, whatever they might be, uh, we'll see the benefits when the agreement comes into effect and removes those barriers. Val, this uh, free trade agreement promises to lift tens of millions of people out of extreme poverty. Uh, do these kinds of free trade agreements really lift all boats? We know what a painful problem poverty is on the continent. And, and what are sort of the immediate challenges that you see that this economic block will have to overcome? Well, very good question, really. The immediate challenges that they will need to overcome, actually, is, the, is addressing the problems or the plight of uh, female and youth-owned uh, SME traders. Uh, they comprise um, more than 79% uh, of the workforce in Africa. And so right? these are informal Yet, traders, right? Well, They've been um, working in the informal economy? The inform well, basically, the SME sector they uh, hire more than 79%, but you're right, more than 60% of that 79% are in the informal sector. Mm -hmm. So having to deal with questions about, inform, um, you know, the uh, gaps in information, um, access to information, access to markets, access to capital is a big deal. The definition of SME uh, within the OECD is very different from the definitions within um, Africa. And oh, so sorry. most of our SMEs in Africa uh, do not have um, collateral to be able to access uh, capital. The bar is so high for them. Uh, sometimes it's over 100,000, um, you know, in terms of uh, equity and, uh, that they need to have to be able to qualify to have the 100,000 uh, US those. dollars? Yes, because the definition for in, in Africa is totally different from OECD. OECD 
is for S to be an SME, especially on the, the M of the SME, you have to be a business that hires more than about 250. Africa has similar, but they also have revenues attached to it. Right, Nigeria, don't quote me, 50 million um, Naira, but you see, with inflation, it's really difficult mm -hmm. for them to meet the bar. Most of my clients that are SMEs, female-owned SMEs, I work with, my, I'm the CEO of Afro Cosmo Development Impact. I have survivalist clients and opportunist clients. The survivalist clients especially can't meet uh, the uh, demands that are expected of them with respect to the loans in terms of collateral. Sometimes what is a survivalist they, client? Survivalist clients, good question. They're the ones that are really hard hit with respect to being able to, you know, when we talk about, you talked about what the guests were looking for when they came. Yeah. Where they were, um, he did an awesome job, His Excellency, because we're looking at his pioneer role, inclusivity issues, and also capacity issues. The and we're going to talk about those a little later on, but I just explain to us what a survivalist. Yes, survivalist um, clients yeah. are clients who are not capitalizing on opportunities out there in the markets. They're surviving, they're living from hand to mouth. The informal trader, for instance, who's in the street, a street hawker. Mm. Those are what I call survivalist clients. My company deals with uh, food supply. In the food supply chain, we have farmers from cradle to grave. So the small scale farmer, the farmer who's probably not registered their business, or even if they have, they're surviving. They can't meet the requirements or in terms of eligibility requirements for getting loans. Those are basically survivalist clients, right? In terms of the, not just the size, but also their financial capital, how much they have in terms of assets versus liabilities. They basically have nothing. They just, they're not capitalizing on opportunities out there like the cheetah generation, the African diaspora, technology, you know, high tech gurus, you know, that are opportunist clients. We have some of those two, and in the creative industry, we have some of them, and the renewable industry, where they have a higher bar and they have more capital, they have more assets mm. and stuff. So that's what we're basically talking about. They're, we're yeah. going to come a little uh, later on to access to finance, because I really want to get to that as well. But Frank, I want to ask you first. Uh, of course, we have to think about domestic interest groups. Uh, when we think about, is everybody on board with this? Is everybody happy? And here I'm talking about sort of the smaller business community, labor unions, and I want to talk about free trade agreements in other countries a little later on. But there was one criticism of the North American free trade agreement, or NAFTA, which was this free trade zone for Mexico, Canada, and the United States. And one of the criticisms there, of course you're aware, was that this pact is, was essentially undercutting the bargaining power of American workers because US companies could simply relocate to Mexico where it's cheaper, labor standards are different, and then sell back to the United States. And are these the same risks uh, that we can expect in the, in the African context? Uh, well, it's a little bit different with respect to the African agreement because the differences in wages are not quite as striking as between, say, the United States and Mexico. So to the extent there's any dislocation in labor, it's going to be minimal based on the smaller differentiation in wages among African countries. Remember, this agreement doesn't directly cover the United States or Europe. It only covers African countries. And therefore, the barriers that are being removed are African barriers for intra-African trade. So things like uh, wages, labor issues, are only going to be affected to the individual person based on the differences in wages between and among African nations. And of course, we can expect that there, there might be resistance at home in these individual countries. I mean, uh, the landscape is not the same in, in say, um, Nairobi as it is in Johannesburg. So wh what kind of resistance might we see and from whom, especially as this free trade agreement begins to play out in very real terms in economies? Well, I, it, the agreement has already been ratified. So the question of holding it up is really uh, academic. It's not really going to happen. What you're going to see is possibly long term some feeling that the benefits of open trade are not being spread equally among all sectors. So theoretically, an individual worker or a labor union may feel that because free trade is opening up markets, their interests are being jeopardized. That happens all the time with any free trade agreement, including NAFTA. So 
as sort of an expected price you pay for having open and free trade. Uh, Val Wamkilemene has said that Africa would be making a catastrophic mistake if we do not include women and young people um, in the implementation of this trade agreement. And here, of course, he points to young people, as you alluded to earlier as well, and women-run small and medium enterprises. But many of these very groups, of course, lack access to financing. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you think needs to be done to ensure that this free trade zone is really inclusive and does offer opportunities for, for women, especially, to access financing. Yes. Um I think beyond access to financing, let me say in terms of access to financing, I, I think especially for that clientele, in other words, the survivalist clients, the youth, female-owned SMEs, when we say SMEs for your audience, small, medium enterprises, right. there's also the micro side. I think we, they need to diversify the scope of, of financing, the kinds of, or the nature of financing opportunities that are available to that uh, demographic group. In other words, it needs to be beyond loans. Mm -hmm. Already, the good news is there's fintech, there's factoring. I'm not a, a, a finance expert, but to the extent that I know this, there's also grants being offered, there's equity, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities out there that they should have. And also fringe benefits, too, that should be available to them. I'm looking, I'm thinking in terms of street hawkers, offering them uh, maybe um, subsidized, um, you know, uh, parking spaces, you know, more hygienic sports you know, for them to be able to sell their products and all. So it's more than just loans, so to speak. Right now, the, the, the field is loaded with people who want to offer them loans. But there should be more, and of course there's fintech, there's factoring, but there needs to be more grants, there needs to be more creative financial mechanisms that, you know, could be offered to them, right? Does so, there need to be uh, more education to, excuse me, more education as well into what is available? I come from, from South Africa. Sometimes we talk about the wonderful laws and benefits that mm -hmm. are available to people, but there isn't the same level of education and yes. uh, just sharing of information so That's people right. do know what their rights are or what mm -hmm. they have access to or, or are entitled yes. to. Absolutely, Heidi. This is absolutely what we're doing. Frank and I work in this area of uh, information gap, especially in the area of business, trade, legal knowledge because we believe it's the bloodstream of access to finance, access to um, markets. You can have all the money you have or want. You can have all the markets, you know, access to markets, but if you're not able to have information as to what is available in terms of where do you need to go, what, what are your rights and duties under those laws, forget about it, it won't happen. So basically, yes, there needs to be, uh, you know, in terms of uh, filling up that gap as to, um, you know, their inability to know where to go to fill out forms. My company, Afrocosmo, we run forums and we had a, a, a session, I think, 2020, and the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Women and Social Services talked exactly about what you're saying. The women in the markets, especially in the informal sector, when COVID-19 hit, mm -hmm. they were so concerned. They were wailing and screaming in the marketplaces. Most of them didn't even know where to go to access funds, funds that were available for them. This is in Nigeria. So the issue of knowing where to go is also a big deal. The information gap is very critical. That's the inter intellectual capital is how I call it oftentimes undermined, but very, very critical I'm, I'm in the so process. I'm so hopeful that that will be really one good thing that comes out of it, is that people understand and are educated about the benefits that exist for them. Uh, Absolutely. Frank, uh, what are the most important lessons here that Africa can glean from other free trade agreements? Uh, just, I'm thinking, like NAFTA or the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, which I find a little vague, but, or the European Free Trade Association, what are some of the, the do's and don'ts for, for Africa here? Well, I think the big challenge for Africa is increasing visibility. There's not a great deal of recognition, certainly in the United States, but also within Africa, of what this agreement is and how it benefits individuals. So the institution has to do a lot of work in terms of explaining what the agreement is, how it benefits companies and individuals, and how people can take advantage of, for example, the financing options that Val mentioned. All of those require education because the agreement itself is just on paper. The real benefits come 
when there's execution of that agreement, which requires knowledge by interested parties. That's the biggest challenge. Uh, Val, what's your take? What, what can Africa learn here? And what do you think are the most important things that the continent needs to avoid? Um, basically, what they can learn from this is that, uh, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day as His Excellency said at the meeting that we organized, Frank and I uh, organized with uh, Her Excellency uh, Sukama Futsi, the AU ambassador. And so it's gonna take a bit of time for us to get there. And just to chorus what uh, uh, Frank said earlier, information gap is critical because the, uh, the agreement cannot, uh, the uh, AFCFTA can never be fully implemented if people out there who are the beneficiaries and the stakeholders are not aware of it. And they're doing a good job so far with educating the masses, but it's gonna take a while for us to get there. As I say, Rome wasn't built in a day, so we're gonna do it, definitely. And, I'm and, optimistic. And there are masses indeed to, to educate, so a lot That's of right. work that lies ahead. Um, right. Frank, um, final question to you. Wamkele Mene says, while the dream is, of course, for Africa to eventually be able to negotiate with the rest of the world as a regional bloc, this free trade pact will not affect any other really bilateral trade agreements that African countries might have in place with, say, trade partners outside of the continent. Now, with, of course, new market opportunities at African countries' disposal, what impact do you think this, will, this continental free trade zone will have on, Afri on the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, or GOA, going forward? Especially given that countries um, have had to meet pretty rigorous eligibility requirements with a GOA, and they've constantly had to defend their eligibility. Right. That's a very good question. Uh, AGOA, as you know, expires in a couple of years, so it's important to coordinate that program with the AFCTA. Uh, you may be aware that the United States has already begun negotiations for a free trade agreement with Kenya. It just started. It's a long way off, but I think it's a precursor to what's going to come. That is, the United States will offer its market open to African countries and the real opportunity there is for all the members of the AFCFTA to join in a free trade agreement with the United States or with Europe or with Asia. That is where the benefits transcend Africa internally and promote external growth through increased exports. So long term, that's the best uh, opportunity that I see. How do we ensure that countries, that, that this agreement doesn't just benefit mainly countries like the economic giants, South Africa and Nigeria, and that smaller countries also get in on, on the, this, this pie, they get their piece as well. I know Wamkele Mene referred to manufacturing and, and the textile industries in places like Lesotho, for example, very, very small country, probably needs this more than anyone. But uh, if you look at South Africa, which traditionally does have um, monopolistic tendencies if I was to put that lightly, uh, how do we ensure that they do not end up benefiting the most and that this really does uh, have benefits for everyone? Well, actually, that's a good example. South Africa does have a lot of barriers to trade within Africa, so they have committed to eliminate those. And when those barriers are eliminated, all other countries, including Lesotho and all the smaller African countries, will now have access to a giant market, which was essentially denied them because of South Africa's own internal policies. So it's a huge step forward for the bigger African countries to remove their barriers, and they do have a lot of them, that will inure to the benefit of the smaller African countries. That's really the long-term benefit these smaller countries will realize. Uh, Val and Frank, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been really enlightening because, you know, we haven't really had this mm -hmm. conversation about it. I mean, there's a lot of excitement around it, the um, free trade zone opening up, but really, as we look now with what what's next. And so mm -hmm. I thank you very much for your perspectives you, and I, I thank you so much You're for welcome. your insights and I thank you for the opportunity that you invited me um, so that I could actually do the interview with Juan Kilimene. Right. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting us. You are most yes. welcome. Thank you, Frank. Well, thank coming you for up, having us. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up after the break, we'll speak to the folks at Africa No Filter about their new report that unpacks African and international narratives about business on the continent and why some of those narratives they say can be downright dangerous. We'll be right back. 
health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. video you just saw is a snapshot of a new study by the donor collaborative Africa No Filter. Their Business in Africa narrative report looks at the way the media, especially international media, covers Africa and how that coverage affects investment on the continent. They found that keywords, stories, frames and narratives associated with business on the continent are dangerously distorted. Also, business opportunities in Africa are underrepresented, especially in international media. Now, for more insight into that report is Natasha Kamani. She's a research and media program lead for Africa No Filter. And she joins me now from the Kenyan capital of Nairobi. Natasha Kamani from Africa No Filter, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Uh, Natasha, tell us what prompted Africa No Filter to commission uh, this Business in Africa narrative report. What was the initial question that you wanted to answer? Well, uh, at Africa No Filter, we believe that there was no better moment to change the investment narrative on Africa. And in, and in order to do that, we needed data. Well, there was a lot of conversation around business and investment in Africa, it was not quite clear what narratives existed within the media and what stories Africans and, and, and those in the international space had about Africans and investing on the continent as well. So for us, it was important to investigate uh, the news and content about business in Africa and the impact of perceptions about Africa as a business and investment destination. And I'm very curious uh, about how you went about investigating this. Tell us how and where you conducted uh, this research. Thank you. Uh, the report analyzed over 750 million stories published between 2017 and 2021 on more than 6,000 African news sites and 183,000 sites outside the con site, uh, continent. Insights were gained using eight research approaches, including analyze trend, analyzing trends on Twitter, academic research, and literature reviews, as well as 22 global business indices. Uh, Natasha, what were some of your main findings? We're going to go into some detail a little later on, but I'm just looking for top lines here. Some of our findings included that Unfortunately, there is more negative coverage around business in Africa. International media are more likely to, to negatively frame issues that impact on business in Africa, while African media are, like, are twice as likely to reference corruption in their coverage. Another example is foreign power scramble for Africa. 70% um, of international coverage about business in Africa is dominated by references of power such as China, the USA, Russia, France, and the UK. Another sad finding is that Africa often is considered 
just to be two countries, Nigeria, South Africa, and sometimes when news media stations are being generous, Kenya, um, where we forget uh, the other business stars like Mauritius, Botswana, and Seychelles, perhaps because they're smaller countries. Uh, another thing that we found was that Oftentimes, we silence creativity and innovation, uh, technology as well, despite Nollywood being the world's second largest film industry and the growing impact of music influences like Afrobeats and Ama Piano on the continent. Another finding that we found was that young, the youth and women are underrepresented. While Africa claims a top three spot in the MasterCard Index for the highest concentration of women business owners in the world, media coverage around this and, and youth is under, um, unfortunately, 12%. So draw for us the connection then. Is there a direct line then that you can draw between uh, these narratives that you just mentioned, the kind of imagery we see in the media, and just the general framing of these stories, and how it actually impacts investment uh, in African countries? Thank you. Thank you. What we found um, in our research uh, generally at African or Filsa is that stories and perceptions and the perceptions they create are very powerful. Stories about business in Africa and how they are framed have a direct impact on the individual's motivation and desire to set up new businesses and to trade with, invest in, or finance businesses. And that's why this report shows why it's critical to shift perceptions about business in Africa and presents over 30 trends that many analysts and business writers can often miss out on. Uh, one of the, the frames that, that your report shows as problematic is this around government's uh, policy and regulations and that these tend to dominate headlines about Africa in international media. If we're talking about investment, one would think that you'd want to know more about the climate, the political climate, the sort of regulatory climate in the country. Uh, would that not be the case? Absolutely, that's the case. But what we found was not a focus on the regulatory framework, but here we saw a major focus on whether or not uh, businesses could survive uh, because of the government at play. While that is an important question to unpack, you know, the regulatory framework and the things affecting businesses on the continent, it's important to do a deep dive on how these businesses are thriving, what exists and what makes those businesses on the continent do better. So I, we have found that while it is important to investigate, you know, the existing trends, especially around the climate, um, it is a bit unfortunate that the only thing that we focus on is government, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and the negative environment caused be between um, growth and job inequality. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah. Well, also um, missing, you say, is, is um, more coverage around the um, free trade area um, and investment. Tell us a little bit more about why that's problematic. Absolutely. Um, the AFT, AFCFTA agreement is going is makes up only one percent of news and academic coverage. Yet the agreement is expected to lift thirty millions of Africans out of extreme poverty and boost the incomes of nearly sixty eight million others. It's also projected to boost Africa's income by four seventy billion dollars by twenty thirty five and increase our exports. But how is it going to do this when, one, there's not a clear understanding of the impact of, of this agreement, but most importantly, it hasn't been broken down for, uh, to, for, for Africans to realize that it impacts their everyday lived experiences. So what we found that there was a huge gap. Well, this thing is meant to transform. This agreement is meant to transform the lives of Africans. It only makes up 1% of news and academic research. And that, quite frankly, is extremely worrying. We know the issue around, um, you know, the, the idea around uh, the, the single narrative and how problematic that is about Africa. As someone who works, who is from Africa, but who works in international media, of course, the stuff is very glaring when you see it because you look at, at a particular story or a particular framing of a story and you think, this is not where I come from. This is not how things are. We know better and we should do better. But how do we balance what is bad news and what is, um, you know, news that, that just does not make the continent look good, that are the fault of perhaps leaders or groups on the continent? How do we balance that with 
the good news. Uh, one is almost sometimes a little reticent um, to, to cover some issues because we just know that it's not seen or, or perhaps perceived in the same way um, on the continent. And of course, Africa is a big place. Uh, people will read things differently. But what is your advice about the, the balance that the media should be striking here? Well, um, it's all about nuance. And every story often has different elements. We have found in our research, both in how the U.S. covers, uh, U.S. media covers Africa and how African media covers Africa, is that oftentimes the frames are very narrow. The stories don't have the complexity and the nuances and the dynamic nature of Africans themselves. And while, for example, we see um, in the coverage um, of, of, of crisis globally, uh, especially in the West, um, a lot of uh, citizens are given dignity in their stories. That is often robbed when it comes to the everyday mm. lived experiences of Africa. Um, our stories are only told through the lens of tragedy, corruption, poverty and struggle. While these are things that we are navigating, there are still other things about us that must be told. And when you constantly tell a particular story, that is often the story that sticks. And when that happens, you find that the impact then is, it affects what is funded, not just business-wise, but when it comes to development as well. We focus on certain things and often assume that we know better than those who are living and experiencing these things within the continent. I'm so glad you're talking to me about this, especially the part about dignity, because that is something that is very close to my heart. I always think it's very yes. simple as a journalist working elsewhere in the world that when you look at imagery, um, a, a about people from our continent, especially women, and how they are portrayed yeah. in the media. It's very simple. If you look at an image, is this how I would want my mother or my sister or my cousin or someone in my family to be portrayed? Um, and would I yeah. be okay with that kind of image? And I think that kind of you know answers a lot of questions for you right there. Uh, do you Absolutely. find that there are um, problem areas in, within African media and within the media, local media in particular countries too, about how how groups, how how the countries themselves are portrayed even in media on the continent. Absolutely. And um, we actually did uh, publish a piece of research, how African media covers Africa. And some of our findings, again, were a bit disturbing and disconcerting, in including the fact that one third of all African stories and news outlets on the continent are sourced from foreign news services. And of course, there are many reasons for this, you know, lack of financing and capacity. But the thing is, as a result, Stories about Africa continue to be told through the same persistent and negative stereotypes and frames. Like I mentioned earlier, poverty, disease, corruption, poor leadership, and, 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 and conflict. Um, and, and again, 63% of outlets surveyed in our work don't have uh, correspondence in other African countries. Um, and, and this leads to uh, stories being uh, lacking nuance and lacking complexity because um, of, of the lack of presence uh, by African media in these African countries. Another of our findings was that 81% of the stories analyzed were classified as hard news, conflict and crisis driven by events. Uh, and again, they're also very large, uh, largely political in nature. And, uh, and the challenge, again, of, of just telling this, these stories uh, using this particular lens is that you forget that behind these stories are human beings, not just struggling and suffering, but human beings who are innovating, thriving, living, and expanding in their scopes. So when you only tell one story, then you actually not just rob them of their dignity, you also rob them of their humanity. Natasha Kimani, this has been an enlightening conversation. Thank you so much for sharing some of the details from this report with us. Um, we do thank you for your time. That's Natasha Kimani. She is the research and media program lead at Africa No Filter, joins us from Nairobi in Kenya. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Have a lovely day. Same to you. And that is our show this week. Thanks so much to all my guests for joining me and all of our affiliate stations who are airing Straight Talk Africa across the African continent. And to you for spending time with me on television, radio and online. Thank you so much. From our team here in Washington, until next time, take care. Goodbye.